So this is, once again, Jessica, I'm Faye, and that's Pamela and Anupia, and the title of our presentation is Diving Into Death. Yeah, alliteration. <laughs> so um, the challenge we were given is to analyze data in order to find a way to improve live work and play in Toronto, and we decided to make a study about that risk. For our data, we use the Wellbeing Toronto uh, data set from the Open the Data Toronto uh, website. Uh, this data was collected in 2011, so it's not quite as recent as we hoped, but it's our, the best we can do. Um, so it, and we chose this because it contains various data sets, including demographics, education, health, etc. Um, this data had a large range of topics, and but we eventually chose our topic, just that. So our goal was, uh, regarding the topic we chose to investigate, the purpose of our project was to help civilians and the government identify some factors that lead to higher debt risk, because that's what we're interested in. And we wanted to help the City of Toronto to fix this issue through our research and innovation. So our dependent variable for our project is the debt risk score. We'll be mentioning it a lot during our presentation, so we want to make it clear as to what it is. So the debt risk score is a quantitative measure of the economic status of a neighborhood. So think of it as a ranking. So the higher the debt risk score, the more financially stable you are. And the lower the debt risk score, the less financially stable you are. So the debt risk score is assigned to a neighborhood based on its likelihood of missing three consecutive loan payments. So for example, if you have a high debt risk score, then you are less financially stable, therefore receiving a lower score, which is less than 707. And if you are at a low risk for debt, then you are awarded with a higher risk because higher debt risk score because you are more financially stable. And a high debt risk score will be more than 769. So the debt risk score is calculated for non-mortgage consumer debt, so anything but housing loans. So that would include credit, credit loans, automobile loans, and installment loans. So for our project, we use SAS programming in order to analyze the data. data. First, we created a master table, which combined all the data that um, Jessica here mentioned earlier. Uh, so each column is a variable that describes the measurement, and each row uh, is one of the 140 Toronto neighborhoods. Secondly, we built a linear regression model to compare our dependent variable, the debt risk score, to all of our independent variables, and we only use the continuous and complete data. The forward selection method was used as it selects the most impactful of the independent variables with a 5% significance level. From this, we found nine variables that we found that were uh, significant, but uh, we decided to only focus on four. These were the number of sexual assaults reported, an age-adjusted rate out of 100 of people between ages 50 to 59 who received breast cancer screening, the percentage of neighborhood population applying for rent bank, which is a zero interest loan for those who need assistance in paying for housing, and the percentage of a neighborhood receiving social assistance. So we categorize our effects, uh, our variables into two groups. So variables that have a direct effect of, uh, on debt and indirect effects of debt. So the direct effects, they make more sense because you can see them directly. They have a direct connection with debt, such as social assistance, rent bank applications, there's monetary connections there. And indirect effects is more about the change in behavior of citizens, such as um, sexual assaults in neighborhoods, breast cancer screenings, which are more interesting, and we'll talk about them later. Okay, so now I would like to point your attention to this bubble graph. It is like a self popularization of all our analysis and our results, and it clearly shows the correlations between our variables. So we've created our graphs and our analysis using SAS, and on this graph you can see there's a lot of bubbles, and each bubble would represent a different neighborhood. So on the y-axis would be the debt risk score, and on the x-axis is the number of sexual assaults. Um, the color of each bubble represents the percentage of social assistance recipients. So the darker the color, the more social assistance they're receiving. And then the size of each bubble represents the percentage of rent bank applicants. And lastly, you can see the little labels on each bubble, and they are the rate of breast cancer screenings. And next, um, we decided to show to show our um, the correlations between our variables more clearly. We created different scatter plots for each of our variables. 
So as you can see, this is a scatter plot that shows the relationship between the uh, recipients of social assistance as a percentage of the neighborhood population versus the Debra score. Um, as you can see, there is a negative correlation. Um, so these recipients of social assistance were qualified for Ontario Works Temporary Care Ontario Disability Support Program or special assistance. It can be concluded from this graph that the more social assistance that were given to a neighborhood have uh, lower debt risk scores, which is reflective of their financial health. Um, so we think that these people who qualify for these programs may not be financially independent, as they rely on assistance, and they have to take loans to support themselves and are high, at a higher risk of not being able to pay them back. This graph compares the, the debt risk score to the percent of rent, uh, rent bank capitals. As you can see, there is a negative correlation between the two variables. It can be concluded that those in debt are more likely to apply for a rent bank. As this data shows all applicants and not those who received rent bank, the evidence of financial standing is less substantial. However, it can be seen that uh, in less stable neighborhoods, there are more people who require assistance paying for their rent. Our third variable is a comparing sexual assaults in each neighborhood with the debt risk score. Um, there is, again, a vaguely negative correlation between these two variables. So we concluded that generally, if a neighborhood has a lower financial stability, it tends to have more sexual assaults because there's less support in the community, we believe, and because there's less job opportunities and individuals may tend to lash out in the situation. So this kind of environment may lead to more sexual assaults because the added stress of being in debt affects these people mentally and leads them to make unjust uh, decisions, which we hope to uh, rectify in the future. Okay, this graph shows a positive correlation between the, num the rate of breast cancer screenings in the neighborhood and the debt risk score. So this means that generally more financially stable neighborhoods have more breast cancer screenings. So from this, we can assume that people who are at less risk for death um, make more health conscious choices because they're going to more breast cancer screenings. And co contrasting that, the people who are at more risk to that may not even have the resources to worry about their health. And so here are some ideas for possible solutions to this problem. Uh, there are many ways to improve the financial health of the city, which in turn might affect one of our independent variables. On the other hand, increasing or decreasing one of our independent variables might have an effect on debt, it is as it is inconclusive which factor is the cause of which one is effect. So if we were to, um, here are some of our suggestions to reduce debt risk. One way is to educate the citizens on financial math, such as integrating it into school curriculums or hosting career workshops. Um, more scholarships could be granted as it enables people to gain an education that can lead to higher earning jobs. And this may reduce sexual assaults or increase breast cancer screenings as it is suggested by our research. Other ways so that the government can is uh, a proportional uh, minimum wage to the cost of living. So if the cost of living goes up, then people will still be able to pay to live in this city. Um, we could also have stricter rent ceilings so that in certain places um, the rent isn't going to be above a certain level and that people aren't paying ridiculous amounts for for, for housing. Um, also, we can have low interest rates for um, loans so that um, people aren't paying too much for their debts. And, um, and this will lead to less reliance on social assistance and rent bank, which, have what, which may have an effect on lowering debt risk. Um, other city projects, such as building infrastructure, provides jobs and will also help the city in the long run. So, uh, more in detail, how will this help the citizens of Toronto? Um, by implementing some of these solutions that May and Jessica have mentioned, it would help individuals make better financial decisions. Citizens would feel incre like an increase in their confidence level and more motivation to take on other responsibilities in life leading to higher levels of productivity, so better performance at work, better uh, family life, etc. By contributing to society, they may have a better chance as well of staying out of debt. So better government policies may be able to improve the quality of living within the city. 
Without having to worry too much about their bills, citizens can afford to care about their health and take care of their body. It, it would also reduce stress and improve the mental health of the citizens, leading to reducing the amount of unconventional behavior. Building more infrastructure will not only lead to more job opportunities, it will also um, improve the city and innovate the city for the future. So overall, the implementation of these solutions may lead to a more prosperous, healthier, and safer city. Thank you. Thank you.